Today we'll be doing our second middle stage evolution with Haunter. In the intro of the War Turtle video, I didn't mention this as being one of the better ones and you guys really let me know in the comments. And I'm man enough to admit that I was wrong. With a massive special stat of 115 and a speed of 95 along with its ghost typing making it immune to the plethora of normal damage found in the early game, I really wanted to get the most out of this run and I think the ones of you that really enjoy optimizing playthroughs will really like how this one turned out. Hunter is in a unique position compared to most of the runs I do. I've done an old Ghastly and Gengar run. It's more outdated from about a year ago and me and Scott's thoughts did a Ghastly race this last week and we're optimizing that and getting ready for a video in the future. On top of me getting prepared to stream the redo of Gengar this Friday and that meant outside of some small details, Hunter was pretty much already fine-tuned as a result of that. And before we get any deeper, let me just say that likes and comments are really what helps the channel grow. And if you want to contribute to the growth going forward, just give me a comment. Go down and type in Spooky Season down below, or just give me your predictions for the run. Now, if you enjoy this content or solo runs in general, consider subscribing to be kept up to date. And even if after all of that you still want to support the channel, consider becoming a member. But go grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's just get to the reason that you are all here. Now, the reason why Ghastly and Gengar preparation help me out so much here is because all of these Pokemon have essentially the exact same route for roughly half of the game. Nightshade will be our primary way to deal damage and since damage dealt is based on your level it doesn't really matter what Pokemon that you're using. With only 15 power points the unique challenge the Ghastly line provides us with is maximizing and knowing when to use Nightshade since Lick won't be able to hit the many 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 normal types that litter the early game. Now with that that said, this early, it's just really straightforward. You fight the one mandatory bug catcher, and then you have enough power points just to go directly to Brock. Geodude can't hurt you, and defense curls do nothing against Nightshade, but there are some things to note about Onyx. At level 14, it actually outspeeds us, and if it starts bide and you do even one Nightshade, it'll take you to half health. There's also an interesting Gen 1 interaction with Confuse Raid to where if Onyx doesn't hurt himself during the bide, and it takes a Nightshade, it's essentially just gonna one-shot you. But I do play it a little careful here, and it's not really an issue, we can move on. Now after healing up, this next part, isn't that bad. You do need to use Lick a little bit like I do on this first bug catcher and after that you'll be close to just being able to spam Nightshade. Now it's worth noting at this stage in the game Nightshade is always better in all situations but the gap between the two moves is about as low as it's going to get considering Nightshade only does 12 damage at this stage. Now Lick in most cases will be a 4 or 5 shot here in case you were wondering. When you finish up Route 3 you have to heal and you'll need roughly 14 Nightshades to make it through the two mandatory battles in Mount Moon so you can't really afford to use any extra in case something goes wrong but outside of that there is one key optimization that I made for the run and that's battling the super nerd on the way to the rare candy. Now this is one of the most experience efficient battles that you can do early and even though we just have to spam lick both of his Pokemon only have tackle so it's 100% safe and this is one of the few optional trainers that we're gonna see in the entire run. Now this one is key because at the end of Mount Mount Moon you hit level 17 when you finish up with the final super nerd. This extra experience getting us to that next level really smoothed out the run and rival number 2 is the next destination. I've mentioned that this run feels fully optimized but it is worth noting that this fight could be a little better at level 18 due to the fact that it puts Pidgeotto in a 3 hit range with Nightshade but level 17 it's going to be a 4 hit. The balance between consistency and end game time is something that you always have to kind of wrestle with while doing solo runs but I thought it would be worth mentioning to you guys. I personally didn't do it because it just felt pretty good at level 17. Sand attack is annoying, but my solution here is to toss out a Confuse Ray, and if Pidgeotto just hurts itself once, you not only avoid that potential sand attack, but that means that you get Nightshade into a three shot range, which was the huge benefit of being level 18 in the first place. This battle is a great example of the main problem the Ghastly line faces. Normal types are immune to Ghost, and due to a coding bug, 
Psychic is also immune to Ghost. This means in a battle like this where 75% of the rival's team is either normal or Psychic, we have to solely rely on Nightshade to keep us going, and when it's all said and done, roughly half of my PP is used up in this one battle. With resources being so tight in this section of the game, I feel like it would be a waste to just heal here with this much Nightshades left, so I go forward and I finish up the majority of Nugget Bridge before I replenish my PP. Now there will be a couple of parts like this, but the fact that there are three potential battles that can use Sand Attack on you, it becomes a little bit luck based on if you have to return and heal earlier than you would like, or in the worst case scenario, you might even have to use an Elixir early, but I'm willing to do that if it came to it. Luckily, I don't get any Sand Attack bad luck here, I return to heal, and I'm actually able to finish this entire section of the game while saving both the Elixir and the Aether for later, which really helped out, but we'll get to that in a minute. As for Misty, I tested out doing her first, but it really helps holding off because there's a couple of key things. The first is that it puts Staryu in a two-shot range with Nightshade, and the most important thing is that Starmie is a three-shot with it. Now, I still use Confuse Ray, which didn't really help me at all, but the potential of some Bubble Beam crits before I got to three Nightshades is still scary, but overall, it's very clean and we can keep moving along. Next up, we have another rough segment where Nightshade is really stretched to its limits. It starts early with the Dig Rocket Grunt, but you can utilize Lick on the Machop to give yourself a chance, but you need three Nightshades for the Drowsy, and I'm not even going to talk about how annoying Hypnosis can be here. Now this leaves you with 12 uses of Nightshade, and then you have the mini gauntlet of 5 straight normal tops before you get to Vermilion. In a perfect scenario, about 10 Nightshades is enough, but remember earlier when I talked about Sand Attack luck? Well here we're going to see some bad luck. The first Pidgey goes down without any hassle, but I take just a single Sand Attack when the second Pidgey comes in, and this means a battle that only needed 6 Nightshades to get past ends up burning all of my remaining uses due to missing so much, and I have to resort to using Confuse Ray until the last Pidgey knocks itself out. Now this is just one of those things you have to kind of be ready for, uh, just know that there's a possibility, and when I said saving the Elixir early was key, this is where it comes into play. Now if I only had the ether here, I would probably have to do pick up an extra battle for another ether or even heal and both of those would really throw off this very precise run that I had planned out. Outside of picking up the rare candy behind the gentleman, it's straight to rival number 3. I do use the elixir here and my inner efficiency nerd is upset that I wasted one use of nightshade, but I'll get over it. As for the battle, it's exactly like rival number 2, almost the entirety of the team requires nightshade to get past and this time I take another sand attack, but unlike the triple Pidgey last we just saw, I'm able to not miss too much and I maintain some of my uses of Nightshade. To make sure the rest of the section goes smooth, I do utilize Lick a little bit on the War Turtle. It's a little slow, but the alternatives if I ran out of Nightshade are even slower than that. Now let's skip over to Surge, and this begins the last series of obstacles before we essentially reach full strength in the run. The problem here is that I can't just spam Nightshade because I'm limited, and even though the Voltorb is mostly harmless, it does have Sonic Boom, and Haunter definitely feels that flat HP damage here. On the Pikachu, I can't one-shot it. In the worst case scenario, and what makes the fight difficult would be Thunder Wave, and luckily it just doesn't use it, and is a two-shot range with Nightshade. Now as for the Raichu, it's kind of a coin flip. I need three Nightshades, and if I take two Thunderbolts, it's game over. Confuse Ray is good, it'll up your odds, but here it just doesn't hit itself, and even though it only uses Thunderbolt once, that earlier Sonic Boom puts me too low, and that's a reset that I honestly didn't even have on my radar. The next attempt, I don't take a Sonic Boom or a Thunder Wave from Pikachu, and I'm much healthier going to the Raichu, and it doesn't even matter this time because I get back-to-back -back Confusion procs, and we skip Raichu turns and Nightshade easily finishes off the battle. Now getting Thunderbolt here is key. Since we are getting up in levels and our base special is so high, even when resisted Thunderbolt will likely be a better option over Nightshade in most situations and while we're not at full strength yet, we've at least reached the end of the segment where the ghastly lines pretty much feel exactly the same. Originally I had
had my eye on this last battle here, and I had a route plan where I picked up an extra battle to get rest, because I thought this one might be inconsistent, but it turned out to really not be the case. Now the fact I can't get poison helps a lot, and there's another interaction with being paralyzed and healing that I'll wait to touch on in next week's video, but things like being immune to rap damage and what I just touched on, with Thunderbolt still doing tons of damage just means that this one's not as bad as it was in the Starmie run that I just streamed, for example, and ultimately getting rest, kind of just a waste of time. The only thing worth mentioning in Rock Tunnel is to not underestimate this Cubone. Being weak to ground isn't something that comes up much in the playthrough in Pokemon Red and Blue in general, and this can be scary. Confused Ray just doesn't pan out here, but thankfully, Bone Club doesn't have the best accuracy, and he misses once, and that allows me to move on, but you can see just how low I got. Now, I do hit level 29 at the end of this battle, and I get access to Hypnosis, and you guys know that I kind of despise runs that rely on sleep status as a crutch, but Haunter is a Pokemon that only has to use it about maybe three times total, and I'm okay with that. Now we can skip ahead to Celadon and this is where we can do some quick errands to fully set ourselves up to quickly cruise through the rest of the game. Most Pokemon will at least do the rocket hideout first since it's easy and you can get like 15,000 Poke Dollars to convert that into vitamins but with Thunderbolt not being able to hit ground tops we need to go ahead and shop. This is a really early Mart visit so I do things I don't normally do like pick up all the top floor TMs and sell them for money and this means means that we'll be able to only afford 3 calciums for this run, but with a special as high as Haunters, it, it's not that big of a deal. From there, I pedal as fast as I can to Mr. Psychic's house, and this will pretty much finish up our moveset for the run. And you might be wondering about Mimic or something else, and I'll cover that towards the end, but what you are looking at now is essentially what we're sticking with to the end of the game. Now I take on the Rocket Hideout. I do pick up some PP ups to smooth out the heavy use of Psychic coming up, but since I've already visited the sell it on mark for the one time I can just skip all the high money items that I'd normally get in other runs which does save a little bit of time. Now ladies and gentlemen the run just sort of turns into some cliff notes for the next several segments so let's not add in a bunch of extra fluff and extend this video any more than it needs to be. Giovanni number one is a pushover with the only thing to note is that Kangaskhan takes two hits to go down rather than one. Pokemon Tower and rival number four is a trivial series of one shots nothing to see here and then I pick up the final HMs of the run down in Safari Zone. And in Erica's Gym, I take this path rather than the usually quicker path against a single Execute Beauty on the left, because Execute just resists all of my damage, and the possibility of getting hit with Hypnosis makes for a potentially much longer battle than quickly one-shotting these three Pokemon here, and that's my reasoning. Now as for Erica, the battle speaks for itself. It's three straight one-shots. We can move on. Koga's next, and you might wonder if the Juggle before him were a hassle, and they weren't. Thunderbolt made everything pretty easy, but Hypno is a two shot, and I could just outpace it anyway, even if it wasn't. And in this particular battle, I do have Psychic against Poison Tops, and it's a tale as old as time. I double resist Poison anyway, and I'm immune to self destruct, so this one is actually what I'd consider probably the easiest fight in the entire run. Now let's slow it down just a little bit, and we'll talk about Sylph. Outside of getting the rare candy on the 10th floor, I don't do anything extra, but rival number 5 presented a real potential problem in all of my test runs with all the ghastly line, and here's how I solved it with Haunter. I also don't know if anyone else would notice this, but I do skip the free Carbos vitamins in this run, and that's simply due to the fact that even without them, there's only a single Pokemon in the entire run that will outspeed Haunter, and we'll talk about why it's insignificant later, but it's just something that I could cut out without impacting the run at all. Through precise planning and testing, I hit level 40 right after this rocket grunt before the card key, and this is where I decide to go heavy on the rare candies, and I use a grand total of five of them. And let's just play that rival music, and we'll talk about why. On the Pidgeot, I didn't need level 45, but a few levels before this is where you start getting into that Thunderbolt one-shot range, and it's nothing. Now Growlithe, he's never an issue, but this level does make it a guaranteed one-shot, and it's just, it's not that important. One of the huge reasons for 45 is that Execute is just annoying and will almost always go for Hypnosis, unless you get lucky like I do in the footage and it uses Reflect instead. Level 45 gives me the very tiny 2% chance to one-shot it if I crit and get high 
high roll damage, which is unlikely, but there's still a chance. But it does give me around a 70% chance to two-shot it, and I like those odds. Now, the biggest reason for level 45 is Alakazam, and it's going to be the main antagonist for this run, especially in later fights. There's two key things to note here, and the first is that I outspeed it, and the second is that with only 89 HP, level 45 puts us in that magical guaranteed two-shot range with Nightshade. Now, normally, you'd see hypnosis strategies here, but moving first means that all you have to do is survive one move, and then you can finish it off. You can see here I get crit, and even then, I can just tank it. So this battle is a 10 out of 10 consistency, because even the Blastoise here is a guaranteed one-shot as well. Now, this was the pivotal part of the run, and to get this one to be nearly 100% consistent allowed me to really keep the momentum of the run going. Let's get past Giovanni number two, and we'll be taking a brisk swim down to Cinnabar to maintain this fantastic pace, and there's nothing extra here today, and after a little bit of Tombstone, it's time for another optimization. I use four more rare candies here. It does make this fight a little better because it gives me better ranges for one shots on the first two Pokemon, and it gives me better two shot ranges on the rest, but the main reason that I use rare candies here is because my experience is at like the perfect, most efficient level that it'll be until the end of the run, so let's use the candies here and quickly take a look at Blaine. And there's really not much to say here. Those extra levels I just mentioned makes everything a one or two shot and it's just over quickly. And to this point, the run has been really fast, it's been really smooth, but now we get to some of the first challenges towards the end of the game and that takes us back to Saffron. And we can't hide from our psychic weakness forever, but let's see what I did to offset this one. And I make a mistake here. I'll be the first to admit it. The play here, the, the correct play is to use two Thunderbolts. That's the best play. Two Nightshades works as well. But if you miss the Hypnosis like I do, you're just going to take damage for free. And if you miss the second, you're pretty much dead in the water. It'll be another reset. Now here, I get away with it, but straight damage is the play. As for Mr. Mom, there's a small chance to one-shot it with a Thunderbolt, but you need to get a crit and I don't hear instead it crits me back with confusion and I'm getting kind of low already now Venomoth here is a guaranteed one shot and we just don't have to go over it and now we get into another Alakazam now I can only describe this part as bad luck I hit hypnosis three straight times which would pretty much be enough to end 99% of all battles but Alakazam wakes up immediately each time every all three of the times it wakes up immediately and it takes me out. Now the second attempt, I do the correct play. I go for two straight moves, but there's one small problem that can happen, and that is Kadabra not only goes for Psychic, the strongest move immediately, but it also crits. And I'm not going to bother showing the rest of this battle because it's an obvious reset. Now finally on the third attempt, I use the correct move on Kadabra. Thunderbolt is a guaranteed two shot and it's superior to Nightshade because there's a chance to one shot it if I crit and that's what I do here. And being healthier towards the end, a similar situation goes for the Alakazam as well. Thunderbolt is the play. Nightshade and it are both guaranteed three shots but Thunderbolt has nearly an 80% chance to be a two-shot, and if you just go straight damage, tank a move, it's not that bad. But sometimes, guys, I'm a scared little bitch, so I put it to sleep because I don't want anything happening like a crit from a side beam. But that's pretty much the battle, and for now at least, we can breathe for just a minute. Now, moving on to Giovanni, there's not much to say about Red and Blue's version of Giovanni. It's a laughing stock. It's a joke. Despite being the ground top gym leader, there's only one serious threat on his team and that's Doug Trio. It's very fast and funnily enough it's the only Pokemon on his team with a ground move and the levels and kind of everything leading up to here guarantees that we both outspeed and one shot it which is by design and this means this fight is a route and we can move on to rival number six. And this fight's not as clean as the Sylph rival fight, but it's not really that much different either. Now as for the Pidgeot, guaranteed one shot, get out of here. The same goes for both Rhyhorn and Growlithe, and overall, there's nobody surprised by that. Execute can be tricky, but at level 54, there's about a one third chance to get the two shot, and after it starts a solar beam, I get the range, and things are looking pretty good. Just like with the previous Alakazams, Thunderbolt is the play here. It's roughly a 33% chance to two shot 
shot it, but the three shot is guaranteed. Like before, I'm very scared of this Pokemon and sleep is what makes me feel better at night. And you can see why, because I take some extreme damage, but eventually I convince it to take a little nap and after a few moves, we move to the end. Now normally, you might be concerned with being this low, but there's an all right chance for a one shot on the Blastoise here and I just crit. So now we can start looking ahead at the league. I use one rare candy here and I'm going to pick up the optional rare candy in Victory Road, but have you guys looked at my time? This is nearly Mewtwo pace and the fact that I just now hit over two hours and we are roughly within 15 minutes of finishing the game is kind of nutty and I'm sure one or two of you will wonder about Mimic if it would be a better move here and I'll go over why it's not needed, but let's just dive into the final fights of the game. Lorelai's up first, and up front, I'll tell you that this one is over really quick. Now, even in the worst case scenario, barring maybe Jinx freezing you, this battle is over in 10 Thunderbolts. You could teach Mimic here and take Amnesia from the Slowbro, but consider that taking a turn to learn it, then using two more turns to set up to guarantee one shots on the Jinx and Lapras, and the fact that Slowbro is going to use three Amnesias in that time to really stack up its special means that at best, you're just going to break even on turns with a pretty decent potential to even waste a turn or two compared to if you just didn't use Mimic, so it really doesn't do anything for you. And speaking of not doing anything for you, it's Bruno, everyone. And I guess if you're kind of dumb, you could use Mimic here on Harden or something, but why would you bother when Psychic just obliterates everything? Let's just move on and stop wasting my time. Agatha is third in the pecking order, and there's really nothing that you can do here with Mimic. Hypnosis is the smart play, but remember that you have have to be put to sleep and then get slammed by a dream eater to really lose this fight and i think that the time saving and slightly more risky play is just to go straight psychic and that's what i do here now the worst pokemon on her team aren't one shots without crits but remember that it's me against her 60 percent accurate hypnosis and this way just feels way faster than wasting extra turns trying to be a little bit safer after that i use the rare candy going into lance and there's a few things that you need to know you might already know. The first is that Gyarados is a guaranteed one shot with Thunderbolt, so it's not an issue. And the second is that our poison subtyping and Gen 1 good AI leaves the two Dragonairs and Dragonite spamming agility or barrier forever. Now the Aerodactyl, that's the one and only Pokemon that outspeeds me in the entire run. And you might be yelling, this is why you need Mimic, Matt. But guys, Aerodactyl only has normal moves and he cannot damage us. Now overall, this fight is free. I would say this this is the easiest fight in the game. You can't lose this one unless you tried and we can move on. Now, we only have the champion fight left. And since we are only about 30 seconds away from Mewtwo's time, we're not gonna be beating it today, but we'll talk about that later. First up is Pidgeot and we still got the one shot here. So let's look forward at more pressing matters. As for Alakazam, it's similar here, but to two shot this higher level version, you would not only need to crit on one of your Thunderbolts, you would also have to get some high rolls on the damage so I play it safe I put it to sleep and I use three night shades right on its next it's bulky I can't one shot it but it also can't hurt me back at all so let's not go over this one Arcanine is next and the only use for mimic that would be kind of useful is taking ember here for the next Pokemon but even then executor would still tank four or five total embers before going down whereas nightshade is a guaranteed four shot now we just talked about Executor, but the plan is to put it to sleep, use four nightshades, but this little coconut tree avoids the sleep, and he pulls a reverse Uno card on me, and this does waste quite a bit of time, but eventually I do take it out, and we are only one Pokemon away from ending the run. Blastoise survives a Thunderbolt, but with a special this high, a retaliatory blizzard doesn't do nearly enough damage, and we finish the run with a second bolt, and that's it. Haunter has done it, and not only has Haunter done it, I was absolutely, honestly flabbergasted with how good this run was. I had been practicing Ghastly with an alternate rule set for Scott's thoughts, and even then, I just I didn't expect this. But first, let's take a peek at Mewtwo, and this one just, it isn't great. I'm not bothering leveling up, and I get knocked out a couple of times from a turn one Psychic, and ultimately, it just came down to it not using Psychic, 
me putting it to sleep and spamming Nightshade. It wasn't pretty, but when you are this weak to Psychic going against the 154 base special freak, you have to do what you have to do. You can't blame me. Now, as for the run, Haunter finishes with a level of 60, three resets, and an absolutely amazing time of two hours and 19 minutes. Guys, this is within three minutes of Mewtwo, and I honestly couldn't believe it. Now, right now, Mewtwo sits alone in the S tier since it has no weaknesses and never reset, but outside of the Alakazams, this run came close even with using Nightshade for about half of the game, and it didn't even have any stab moves. So guys, I'm going to pose a question for you this week. Those of you who stick around this far, let me know. As of now, I'm sticking Haunter at the very top of the A plus position, but do you think that this is worthy of also being up in the S tier? Now personally, I'm on the fence about it. I think I need to see a little bit more. I think when we stream maybe Alakazam and Gengar again, I can make that decision more comfortably. I think perhaps S tier should be reserved for Pokemon that crush the game and have zero iffy moments in the run, but maybe I'm just being a little bit too stingy, but please let me know your thoughts on it. Now, I've been using a new tool to refine routes that was developed by a Discord user named Otto, and I believe him and Scott refined and polished this software, but I credit it for saving me a lot of time and just giving me more tools to understand the game better without having to do nine runs and use save states to test the ranges of moves like 25 times in a row. It's just really great, and I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to link it in the description since it's not my software, but I'll find out if I remember to do that. Now, the main thing is thanks to Otto and Scott for this routing tool. It really saves me a lot of time. Now, guys, this has me very excited for this week's stream. We'll be redoing Gengar, and you would think that it would just be a better version of Haunter so we could potentially shave off a few minutes here and there and be within touching distance of Mewtwo. Now, I'm very excited to find out we should find out together this Friday, 2 p.m. Central Time. Don't miss it. And as always, special thanks to my members for providing support. We got Mutus Dozen, D's Master, TR2G Hipster, Cheesy Speakeasy, Josh Ferment, and Kendall C. And I record sporadically, so if you have became a member and you aren't on the list yet, just know that you'll eventually be there. But I appreciate you just the same, and I appreciate your patience even more. And that's all I have for you guys today. Now, starting with last week's video. I'm trying out some new stylings and in general I'm just trying to make my videos better so as always feedback is very welcome and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Bye!